This is when he's talking to uh, talking about Cyrus, the king of Persia, and how he was instrumental in having the temple rebuilt. Correct, correct. I'm talking to my friend David, the theologian. So in Isaiah 45:11, it uh, says, "Thus says the Lord." So thus says Yehovah, the Holy One of Israel, and His Maker. Ooh, so it's God and Jesus. Interesting. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons. And concerning the work of my hands, you command me. Oof. Mm. What are you going to do with that, church? What are you going to do with that? Sorry, I actually did not hear what passage you were talking about. What passage is that? Allergies. Isaiah 45, 11. Uh, Isaiah 45, 11. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of things in there that make you go, hmm. Yeah, because then people go to Job and say, look, God gave Satan permission to attack Job. And actually, a good common friend of ours, Mr. Thaddeus Metzger, the other day, pointed something out to me when Satan, when actually when God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? They turned it, the um, translators turned it into a question, but in the original Hebrew, it's not a question. It's a statement. Hmm. Hmm. And then the church writes songs about God gives and God takes away, or we don't know why this or that. And it really seems like we're beating up on the body of Christ, and the Lord knows our heart. He loves them. I love them. You love them. I know you love them. I just put up or shut up, man. Yeah. The world needs us. Israel needs us. God gave the gospel to Israel, and Israel didn't do what he wanted them to do with it. They dropped the ball. And he said, now I'm going to take it to the Gentiles. Let's be real, though. Wasn't that his plan the whole time? It's like when Jesus, no one takes my life. I lay my life down. Mm -hmm. It was always the plan to have him as our Savior and Redeemer. Yeah. I mean, the the Old Testament. The slain before the foundation of the world. Yeah. The Old Testament is full of prophecies about the... Um, Israel being restored at the end times and being a light to right. all of the nations. So for the rest of time, yeah, God's plan was always to save all of us. Right, but Israel was supposed to have a hand in it, and unfortunately, yeah. they uh, decided to reject that plan. Right. But thankfully, there's a comeback. The Lord has plans to restore them. Glory, yeah, yeah, and there's a I guess a faction of the. Believers, that goes around with, um, what's that, replacement theory? Never really looked into it, where the church has come to replace the Jews. Well, I think I've the whole replacement theology thing, I think theology, replacement... Thank you. That's the word. I think replacement theology is kind of a... From what I understand, it's kind of a, a way to attack... Um, people you disagree with. So not everyone fits into this. Oh my God. Okay. Get out of me. All right. Anyway, not everyone fits into this, uh, these categories super neatly, um, especially not Pentecostals and charismatics, but that it is kind of a, uh, there are definitely two big camps regarding the um, how you interpret scripture. Mm-hmm. Uh, one would be called dispensationalism, and the other one is called covenant theology. Mm-hmm. So dispensationalism is centered around the idea that God um, works in what are called uh, dispensations, so that times, places, peoples, he has, his character doesn't change, but his way his particular way of dealing with a particular people at a particular time is different depending on, um, is different from situation to situation. Mm -hmm. So um, where the big, sort of the big controversy comes in is dispensationalists believe in a strict separation of prophecies for the church and prophecies for Israel and dispens- dispensationalism always, always is accompanied by um, premillennial theology because the idea among dispensational dispensationalists 
is that the church age is almost like, and the church age is from, from the time that Jesus went, rose from the dead Mm -hmm. until now, until Jesus comes back. That's the church age. Mm -hmm. So dispensationalists operate under the idea that the church age is kind of a pause on God's plan for Israel, so to speak. Mm. So there's all sorts of prophecies about the restoration for Israel, and there's all sorts of prophecies that a lot of evangelicals like to quote as applying to us in either a spiritual or a literal sense, depending on what the particular passage is. Mm -hmm. Um, And dispensationalists like to push back against that and say that, no, those prophecies are specifically for Israel, and that during the millennial reign of Christ, the restoration of Israel will take place and those prophecies will come to pass. And on the opposite side of the fence, you have covenant theology, which views the church and Israel as one people of God. You know, like uh, Paul talks about in Romans, how we were grafted in Mm -hmm. to the seed of Abraham. So we're essentially heirs of God's promises to Abraham because we were grafted in through the blood but of Christ. But with Israel or in place of Israel? No, no, with Israel. So it's, so passages... So can they both be partially right? Yeah, and we'll get to that. Okay. So passages, so according to coven, covenant theology, uh, biblical prophecy can be for the nation of Israel at a particular place and time, whether it was at a time that's already passed or a time in the future, such as the millennial reign. And it can also be for the church for now. Passages like uh, Jeremiah uh, 29, 11, I think it is, for I know I have, for I Thoughts know I the plans I have for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Stuff like that, that people often quote for us now, that's, that's coming yeah, from a covenant that. theology mindset. But what happens is, is these two groups because people love getting into camps, tussle Actions, with each other. Right. And what I found is that the whole replacement theology thing is kind of a pejorative that dispensationalists came up to throw at covenant theology people. When I'm with you, I think there's merit to both ways of thinking. Right. Well, the scripture I'm looking it up right now, Second Timothy 2.15 be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then on to 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if it's all given for all things... We just have to rightly divide because there are portions that were written to, for example, a big hot topic one in eschatology circles, Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. Those were Jewish boys asking questions regarding Rome, the coming kingdom, um, the temple, restoration, and those such things. And I think as a church, we can read it now and say, look, see, we will be here. No, look, see, we won't be here. And, mm-hmm. and you're taking out of context. That's what rightly dividing the word is. Who was the letter written? Who was Jesus talking to? So that's not that there's not something for us by all means, because it says right here, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is, we need to use it. However, you can, that's where rightly dividing the word is, is saying, well, who was the audience? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like when Paul said, women need to be quiet in the church, Right. What, who is, what group was he speaking to? Was he speaking to a bunch of loudmouth women that were stepping out of place? Or was he saying, as some other leaders we've talked about before would say, your role is in front of children or other women? Mm-hmm. So rightly dividing the word, I think, is going to be a big topic in heaven <laughs> when we face the Lord. Because I think that's where a lot of factions and a lot of, um, unfortunately, abuse has come from and neglect in many ways. But back to Israel. Let's bless the Lord and bless Israel, shall we? 